And welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. My honor to have on today Dr. Jeff Meyer, someone that I've admired for a long time, a kind of leading voice in the church on worldview. And I want to talk to him about his new book titled Truth Changes Everything. Dr. Myers, thank you for joining us today. If you would, maybe jump in. For those that may not know you or about Summit Ministries, would you give just a brief explanation of your work in ministry? Yeah. Hey, Josh. I have been privileged for the last 10 years to be president of Summit Ministries, this organization in, in a little town in Colorado tucked in right at the foot of Pikes Peak equips and supports the rising generation to embrace God's truth and to champion a biblical worldview. Our core program is a two-week-long course of study that young leaders come to take before they head off to a college or university to become more familiar with what a biblical worldview is and how to stand for truth in their college classes. And out of this program, leaders by the thousands have moved into all aspects of our society, from business to government, the military, medicine, science, education, uh, and so forth. So it's an incredible blessing to be able to participate in doing something to help the rising generation prepare. We all know we need to, but how, what do you actually do? And this program has just been profound in its impact. Uh, just a quick statistic for you, 4%, and you know this as, as someone who's a teaching pastor as well as an attorney, 4% of young adults who regularly attend church have a biblical worldview, 4%. Wow. By the time they finish the Summit Ministries program, 85% have a biblical worldview. So wow. they really grasp truth quickly and figure out how to apply it to their lives. And it sticks. Uh, we're we're studying our students 10 years out now from the program mm. and finding that they are, I mean, there's some drop off, obviously, there always is, but not nearly what it used to be. So it's very exciting. And I'm so blessed. And the focus of this podcast is what do we do as Christians living in an increasingly secular, maybe plural society? Um, that stat of six or 7% of American Christians, you get to the younger generation, it's 4%. Like, that is such a devastating statistic. And so what are we going to do about it? And I'm so grateful that you're here uh, to talk us talk to us about that. Uh, two quick notes. You know, it's 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 I'm sure very rough to uh, suffer for Jesus right there by Pikes Peak. And I think at a recent conference, you're talking about running um, in the Garden of the Gods. And I'm over here. OK, don't be jealous. Don't be jealous. Don't be jealous. <laughs> like that's that's some be some, a beautiful location for students to go. And I'll just say. I was not able to attend Summit personally, but I have uh, so many friends and acquaintances in my work that went there and it literally transformed their life. They look back on that experience as foundational um, to what they're doing now. And so if you have people in your, young people in your church, or even if you're listening to this yourself, uh, we'll, we'll share in the show notes how you can get uh, linked up with Summit. So, so grateful for that. Uh, you, you dug into it just a little bit on what Summit's doing with uh, kind of a two-week experience. But I, I think you also have uh, some online resources and maybe even kind of a semester experience. I'm always just interested in the nuts and bolts. So are there some other ways that Summit is serving that demographic? We also have a gap year program. Our team travels and speaks as well. We have a program called Powered by Summit, where we know not everyone can come to a two-week program in Colorado, even though it's a wonderful thing to do. So we have what's called Powered by Summit, where we will come to your area and produce a summit program for you for any group of any length of time using our instructors. So our uh, different programs have been for churches, for Christian schools. We've done them for service academy cadets. We've done them for uh, Christian musicians. And, and that program has been really uh, exciting. Those those go all over the world. So just keep that in mind if you've got yeah. a church or a group of some kind you'd like to, to work with. We do a lot of media as well, a lot of television interviews, a lot of radio interviews, because people are always wanting to know, how does, a Bible, how does the Bible apply to today's issues? And a lot of people misapply the Bible to today's issues. So we want mm -hmm. to be out there helping people see the truth. And then we have courses for Christian schools, homeschools as well. But the specific one you mentioned is called Now We Live. It is a small mm -hmm. group course for churches that features interviews with well-known Christians who are highly regarded in, in many places today 
people like the actor Kurt Cameron, Alisa uh, Childers, who is a former uh, Christian contemporary music artist who's just doing some extraordinary work, Chris Brooks, who's an urban pastor in Detroit, and many, many others, talking about what a biblical worldview is and how it actually is applied in today's broken society. So that Now We Live resource um, if you're watching or listening to this podcast by now, uh, we will have done everything we can to get the word out about it. But just go to summit.org and you can find out more. That resource is free and you can deliver that to your small groups or life groups in your church and spark some really incredible discussions. So I, I appreciate this greatly because as I've been speaking this year, I was actually speaking uh, kind of in the South to a, a pretty big group, uh, a large group of Christian school administrators who, of course, on the front lines of, of trying to inculcate a biblical worldview. And the question that came up in discussion is, like, all right, where are the resources? Who has uh, this curriculum? Do we do we have to recreate the wheel? And I'm, I'm not a huge fan of recreating the wheel. And and Summit was one of the ones that was mentioned right away. And so if you're you're tuning in and you're familiar with that question, you know, check out summit.org, uh, some great resources and continuing to produce them. So we certainly appreciate that. Well, you, you have a new book coming out, and I appreciate the all the books that you've written. I didn't count all of them, but I think probably getting close to 20 is... Uh... It's, it's 16 books now. Okay. That is all so right. hard to believe, but uh, yes, our, our team gives me the time and the space and the resources to to write. And so we've just really felt that part of our legacy at Summit Ministries is laying down that strong foundation. And they include a, a a trilogy of textbooks that people have used all over the world called understanding the times. And uh, so anyway, I'm super excited about this new book called truth changes everything. I'm probably more excited about this than, than any book that I've worked on since um, the founder of our ministry, David Noble. And I worked on updating the, the classic book, understanding the times. And so what, what prompted you uh, to write this book now, I, th I think many of us can kind of get the general idea. Uh, we we definitely need a solid understanding of truth in our kind of quote unquote post truth culture. Uh, but what specifically led you to write this particular book? And here in the fall of of 2022, uh, releasing it now. Well, Josh, last year I went through a battle with cancer, hmm. and during I. I, I, it was a complete shock. I'm a healthy person. I like to exercise. I eat pretty well I, to, to have a cancer diagnosis and, and to hear the doctor say, this must be treated immediately because you, you have a strong chance to survive. If we treat it aggressively now, you have mm -hmm. no chance to survive if we don't. That's, that is startling news. And uh, my wife, mm -hmm. Stephanie, and I had to grapple with that. We, we wondered, wow, this, you know, this is this. Does this mean life is being cut short? Is what about the what about our wanting to get a sprinter van and roll down the windows and crank up the music and drive around the country and just see our nation? What what about the mm -hmm. opportunity to hold my grandchildren someday? And it really led me to the place where I had to ask, what is true? At the end of it all, what really is true? Because life is fleeting. How do you find meaning in a fleeting life? And I, I guess I realized as I went through that, that, that what I had wanted to write, the next book I had wanted to write now became urgent. Mm. If you could write a book, Josh, and you knew you only had a few months, what would you say? What would be mm. the most important thing you could write? And I realized the most important thing I could write is to address the issue of truth. How do we find it and what difference does it make for living lives of purpose and meaning? That is such a powerful question. What what book would you write if you had just a, a few months left? And it that that certainly is clarifying, but it also and it also strikes me that you've been writing about Christian apologetics. And that question of pain, suffering, and evil, which has been thrown at Christians for so many centuries, and then you had a chance to live it. Um, and I, having heard this story already, I so appreciate your own testimony in, in living out the faith that you've defended for so long. But uh, wow, I, that that diagnosis, and then I, I could see where that would say, hey, I've got to get this book on paper. 
Um, so I'm looking forward to the release of this. From kind of reviewing the book, you have kind of two goals. And so what's kind of the big idea with the book and then these two goals that you've set out? Well, again, the book is called Truth Changes Everything. And I, I should mention, by the way, that as of last week, I am now 12 months in remission from cancer. Okay. So Man, praise uh, God. those who are watching and listening, may if you've gone through cancer, you might have been yeah. alarmed at the way I phrase that. So I want to be sure that I, I complete that. But that doesn't change any of my goals. Every day is a gift. And uh, there, are two, there are two things I wanted to try to do in this book. First of all, is to address the fact that we have now passed a tipping point in our culture on the issue of truth. It used to be the case that people believe that truth exists and we can discover it. We seek the truth. Lately, however, the balance is tipped in the other direction. And it's not only tipped in the culture at large, it's tipped in the church. Half of believers now say that truth is up to the individual. So in other words, we don't yeah. speak the truth. We speak our truth. Mm -hmm. And you've heard people talk about that in the culture. This is actually, uh, this actually could be a death knell for a culture. If this mindset mm -hmm. persists, yeah. there's no way for a culture to survive. Mm -hmm. So it became incredibly important, I felt, to address that to really talk about truth. Can we really know it? And then the second aspect of the book was, well, you know, what kind of book do you write? If you really want to defend truth, do you write a philosophical book talking about the arguments for truth and refuting the arguments against it? And I decided to go a different route. I decided to look at the lives of people who were Jesus followers, who believed that Jesus is the truth and the incredible impact they made on the world in science, in the arts, in education, in understanding the value of human life, in medicine, in politics, in justice, and so many other areas. And I love to tell stories. So yeah. this book is full of stories, ones that people, most people have never heard before of incredible believers. And if we get a chance, I can tell a story or two, yeah. but it's, it's, it was a remarkable thing to look at these lives. These people didn't set out to change the world. They just set out to love Jesus so much that they could not help but be the very best scientists and artists and educators that they could be. And the world changed as a result, even in times of crisis, even in times of uh, what seemed to be the end of the world kind of crisis. They did this. So it's great news for our own time. So I, I love the strategy here. And how God just kind of led you through this, that it, it seems to me that in kind of a hyper individualistic society, as you said, the source of truth is now subjective. It's an, it's internal, but like the one thing that you can't challenge is someone else's story and their like their lived experience. And so I love the fact that, you know, you're, you're answering that dynamic in our culture with, Hey, look at the centuries, uh, the, the beautiful history of the church. And so that's so, so powerful. You know, I'd love to maybe... I know we have limited time today, but maybe just one or two uh, examples from the book that you're highlighting. Well, I love the examples in science. That was one exciting area for me, because when you look back at the history of the development of modern science, and you look at it from the perspective of a lot of people who write on science in the popular culture today, you would assume that there is a battle between faith and science, that they are two completely different ways of knowing, and that science will prevail because it focuses on true knowledge. And what I found in the process is that the early founders of science didn't believe that at all. In fact, they understood that there are certain things about the world that you have to assume to be true that can't be true if there is no such thing as truth, right? Mm -hmm. So um, Robert yeah. Grossetesti was one mm -hmm. of my favorite stories to tell. This guy was an early Oxford University professor. And his name amuses me because Gross is the German word for fat and Teste is related to the French word for head. So there literally was a professor of fat head and he, he taught at Oxford yes. University. Uh, uh, that speaks yeah. to me as a student pastor. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that plays yeah. well. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah fat head is actually, it actually is a compliment, but it's, it's, it's funny. But, but see, so he said, you know, if the, if, if the world really the world really exists it's really here and we can understand it because it's made to be understood 
and we it's stable. So an experiment we do at time A can be done at time B, and, and we can say that experiment was done in the same world. All of those core assumptions come directly from a biblical understanding of how the world came about, and not from a secular understanding of how the world came about. Grossetesti is not that well known in science today. In fact, the word the term science wasn't even used in his day. People talked about experimental philosophy. But his student, Roger Bacon, almost everybody who's gone to science class remembers that name. And he's the one who really helped lay the groundwork for the scientific method. It was fascinating to me to find that of the 52 individuals who founded modern science, only one of them was an atheist. Hmm. And you say, well, that was a long time ago when, cult when Christianity was more culturally acceptable. But John Lennox, who was a professor of mathematics at Oxford University, said that two thirds of the people who have ever received the Nobel Prize in science list Christian as their religious affiliation. Hmm. So we, we, have to, we have to step back and think, are we being told the truth in our society? And if we aren't, what is the truth? And how can we learn how to find these wonderful stories and explain them? And there are some incredible stories. Leonard Euler is one of my favorites. He was a mathematician and a philosopher who studied logic. He discovered so many things that scientists even today joke that when you discover something, you have to name it after the first person, after Leonard Euler to discover it because <laughs> uh, he discovered so many things. Awesome. But he he, he said in his work, the, the reason I am doing this is to bring glory to God. This is an act of worship to God to discover his invisible nature and then find ways to find discover truth, to line it out and to help people's lives be better. That's so powerful. And I'm, I'm looking forward to digging in and hearing about the rest. Um, it, it seems to me, though, some Christians would say, all right, well, we need to make sure we have kind of a strong foundation. And since we have this 4% that have a biblical worldview, like the best we can do is just strengthen the church for the days to come. But what would you say uh, to those that they, like they, they're basically saying, look, truth is lost in the culture. Uh, we don't have much hope of redeeming that. Um, your your book strikes a hopeful and um, I think realistic, but but a hopeful stance. And so, would you explain that? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, let me let me step back from the the book for just a moment. At Summit Ministries, we do a lot of polling. We do we participate in national polls with a reputable national organization. And the reason we don't we don't don't want to become a polling company. We just want to understand our cultural moment. And Josh, what we found is that five to eight percent of people in America are just real jerks. Five to eight <laughs> percent. They are so far left that they just they're kind of lost out there. They don't uh, they don't care about other people. They say their response to conflict is to cut other people out of their lives. That kind of thing. All right. These are the people you see on television screaming five to eight percent. That's it. Two thirds of Americans are pretty common sense. When we asked, do you think the values found in the Bible are important for a healthy American society? 72 percent of Americans said yes. Hmm. So why isn't that getting out? And it turns out that about half the people who are who are thinking well, who are common sense, who have core values, about half of them say, I don't say anything so as not to offend anyone. Isn't that amazing? Mm. The problem today is not the five to 8% who are real jerks. It's the 35 to 40% of people who, when they have the opportunity to say something, stay silent. That's really powerful. It's kind of aim into that in, in the sense that so many times as Christians, like, well, can I say this? Or am I supposed to say this there? And it's that, kind of agreement to silence and even our culture saying don't say anything that gives the impression that truth has died and and we at least individually can be someone to step up and say no this is what god says so you you talk a lot about conversations and how conversations are important to kind of breathing life and truth into other people so you dig into that some 
Sure. Well, conversation comes from the, my focus on conversation in the book comes from something that I've taught our team at Summit Ministries for years. And maybe this will be a helpful word picture. We picture a DNA double helix. OK, so you can can you kind of picture it, the twisty yeah. ladder with the little rungs in it. A DNA, we, we say that the DNA of influence is two strands, truth and relationship. Wow. And those two strands are connected by those nucleotides. Those nucleotides are our everyday experiences that we want to always speak the truth, but we always want to speak the truth in the context of relationship. Truth without relationship comes across as arrogant. Relationship without truth comes across as apathetic. But when you tie the two together, you show that you value people's image-bearing capacity of God, but you also want to walk alongside of them in pursuing the truth. So how do you do it? And there are two things that, that we focus on at Summit. Uh, the, the first one is, is just how to listen well, how to show that you're not just trying to win the argument, but that you really see yourself not butting heads, but walking alongside one another toward the truth. And the second strategy is, is learning to have a good conversation, learn, learning to bring truth in. And very often you can do that through questions. So the listening part of it is really simple and straightforward. There are five conversation altering words. Tell me more about that. Hmm. You're talking with somebody and they say, man, I just, that's so wrong you know, about some, uh, some issue. And it might even be, they're saying that your viewpoint is wrong, but it, instead of saying, well, I disagree, or we'll have to agree to disagree, or, well, you have your truth. I have my truth kind of thing, which is what the impulse would be because we just want to get along mm -hmm. instead, just ask, huh, tell me more about that. You know, why do you say that? And then you can guide the conversation toward truth through questions. This is hugely powerful for the students we work with at Summit Ministries who are headed off to a university campus where, you know, they're in the class, the 75 students and the professor, there is no way to win an argument in that context. Hmm. So what do you do? You learn to ask questions. We teach our students to ask questions like, what do you mean by that? Define your terms. So if somebody says, well, you know, God gives us freedom of choice. That's why we should be pro-abortion. Hmm. What do you mean by freedom of choice? Most people never think to ask that. Uh, it, a second question you want to ask is, how did you arrive at that conclusion? Sometimes my, I've been surprised in different conversations. People will tell me, well, I grew up in a single parent household or, um, you know, I was part of a, cri a crisis pregnancy or, you know, different kinds of things. But how did you arrive at that perspective? If someone says, I could never believe in a God who would allow pain, it's because they've had something painful happen mm -hmm. that they're still grappling yeah. with to this day. Mm -hmm. So just ask, how did you arrive at that conclusion? A third question, and this is a kicker. How do you know that what you believe is true? Oh, that's good. See, people make claims. Even people who say there's no such thing as truth do believe at least that statement to be true, that there's no such thing as truth, right? There is a truth that they embrace. So uh, just asking, how do you know that is true? And then a, a final question that I ask often in conversations, it was used, it was asked of me many years ago and had a, had a big impact is what happens if you're wrong? What mm -hmm. happens if your approach to this issue turns out to be wrong? What would you do? Would you be willing to change? I was in a conversation recently and someone was giving a lot of reasons why they thought Christianity was bad. And I asked, if I could answer all of your questions, I, all of them, I'm not saying that I can, but if I could answer all of your questions satisfactorily, would you become a Christian? And the person said, no. Mm -hmm. I said, well, then you see that the issue is not these questions. There's something else going on, isn't there? Now, you don't even have to finish that conversation, Josh. You just have to let that hang out there. Mm. People start to realize, yeah, there's some kind of a, I've got some kind of a bias that I haven't dealt with. Mm. Now, obviously, you need to be able to speak truth. It, 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. 
So that's why the resources at summit.org, our resource library is free and available to all. Short videos, articles, all kinds of things on all sorts of questions that you can imagine that might come up in discussions about faith. And even how you apply your faith to today's issues like marriage and abortion and all uh, many, many difficult topics. All of that's available. We need to study those things. But don't forget that when you're in the conversation, it's not a debate about the issue as much as it is about who we are as people, where we are going, whether we trust one another enough to go there together, and whether we will accept the truth once it's discovered. Well, that was so rich and uh, certainly worth the price of admission here here today. And it, it's, it strikes me, and, and really our work here in the state of Indiana, now 14 other states that are doing this as well, we realized something very simple about our work in the public square. We forgot about relationship. And we're commanded to pray for those in elected office. Hard to do that if you don't know who they are, you don't know what's going on in their life, regardless of their ideology. And now having been doing this for a few years, been able to see the power of that. Um, even with people I deeply disagree with, um, being able to have the conversation, it, it would just happen no other way. And and so just uh, I put a kind of a a huge banner over that um, exclamation points on how can we engage our friends and neighbors? It's through building these relationships. And also just thinking about how Jesus used questions so effectively in his ministry. It's kind of doing some of the same. And so you talk about a few yeah, ways I that... Go ahead. Uh, let me mention one other thing there, because I, I, I just want to underscore this. So this is like a double underscore now. But yeah, here we go. When, you, when you're working with someone in the legislature who you completely disagree with on issues, once you realize that person is not, their, their agenda is not the sum total of who they are. Mm -hmm. They may have children, or they may have friends, or they may have hobbies, or they might have a pet that they really love our lives are bigger. And we know that, like, I, I believe things, but I'm not the sum total of the things I believe about political issues. There's something more to me. And if somebody takes time to get to know me, then I'm more willing to consider the things they say about what they believe. And, and so certainly the foundation of a relationship is some form of trust, that this person trusts you enough. Uh, and we'll often mention the pastors, we go into these meetings, look, this is not fuel for social media. You know, we're having this conversation and it stays right here. So how, especially with so much polarization in our, our society, how do we build trust with those that disagree with us? And you, you give a number of ways in the book, maybe just one or two. Well, one of the ways is to talk about the talk. And that is, uh, uh, you know, that comes from my brother, who's a, a pastor, and he was talking about doing marriage counseling. And he said, you know what I've noticed? What it's about is never what it's about. <laughs> this is so true. <laughs> so you learn to talk about the talk in a conversation. It's perfectly fair to say, I don't have a lot of conversations with people who believe what you believe. And I feel a little bit nervous because I feel like I should be able to debate the finer points of this or that. But I hope that our conversation can continue and that I can go back and find answers where my knowledge is lacking. And then we can continue the conversation. Would that be okay with you? Mm. Uh, even acknowledging differences. Uh, it's okay to have differences. It's actually good. We're doing what America was designed for right now by having a heated disagreement. I just want you to know, we might not end up agreeing, but I respect who you are as a person, and I want the conversation to continue. Those kinds of things diffuse a lot of the tension that we feel might make these sorts of relationships very uncomfortable, and then allow us to, to bring it back to, we really need to talk about this. This is really important, but I just want you to know that I, I know we have differences. I acknowledge those differences. I respect you. And I trust you in this conversation, in this relationship, to say what you really think and, and hopefully be willing to hear what I really think. That's so so rich, again, uh, just being able to preface it. And I'm sure the other individual that's that's connecting with you is also probably nervous about the conversation. And so just kind of stating the obvious, we're all a little awkward here. Um, we don't 
American culture certainly doesn't give us an example of how to do this well. And I've, I've often thought for Christians, like what other motivation out there would cause somebody to kind of reach across the aisle ideologically and build a relationship with someone if it's not motivated by the gospel. And so I think we, we need to go first. And so you, you've talked about kind of building the relationship. Of course, we, we do want to bring truth into it. And in the book, you, you give, uh, it's a very simple idea. It's so true. And that is that truth rarely hits people over the head. And so how do we, like, how do we help? How do we understand how truth is revealed to people and then, you know, work in such a way that we're bringing the truth to them, but then they'll grab onto it, not just reject it. Yes. Let's start with what, how we even know that truth really exists. One of the things philosophers use is called the law of non-contradiction that you, if I were to look out the window and say, it's raining, it, you, you would look at, you might look out and say, no, it's not raining. Well, it cannot both be raining and not raining at the same time in the same sense. So one of us needs to adjust our perspective that this is true. And we know that there are scientific facts. So if, if you were to say to somebody, well, did you know that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level? It would not be reasonable for that person to say, you know, keep your opinions to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that may be true for you, but that's not true for me. If someone said, um, oh, Martin Luther King was shot on April 4th, 1968, it wouldn't be reasonable for another person to say, well, maybe that's true for your culture, but in my culture, it's different. No, that would not be a reasonable response because we know there are scientific facts. We know there are historical facts. Here's the kicker. We also know there are moral facts. Now, people might not say uh, care that much about dogs, but there you absolutely have to recognize there's a difference between these two statements. Statement A, it is good to care for abandoned puppies. And statement B, it is good to torture abandoned puppies. <laughs> Right. Those cannot be the same thing. They are they are different. So the so the kinds of questions I have in conversations are how would we know what the facts are? Would could we agree that there are facts? Or is this just a battle over whether your opinion or mine prevails in the public mind? Because a lot of people have that viewpoint. You know, the postmodern professor Stanley Fish said, You are entitled to your own facts if you can make them stick. Mm. So he doesn't believe there are, are facts. Uh, what, what does a good society look like? How would we know that we've achieved our goal? What's happening? What, do, what happens to people if we achieve our goal? Uh, you know, a lot of people say, for example, on the abortion issue, oh, it's all about freedom of choice. Is it really about freedom of choice? Because I've seen a study from uh, the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons that shows that 75% of women who get an abortion say they felt pressured to do so by someone else, a boyfriend mm -hmm. or a mom. That's not freedom of choice, mm -hmm. you see? So you have to sort of break down the mantras that are, are there in the culture. You can do that by asking questions, but those sorts of questions have to go back to what does a good society look like? What is our purpose mm -hmm. as human beings? Why are we here? What are we here for? Not just what does it mean to be good, but why should we be good? You know, from an evolutionary viewpoint, you should only be good if it helps you reproduce or live for another day. Otherwise, it doesn't good is not a relevant category. Does that make sense? So absolutely. A lot of times in these conversations, we just start with, well, I support this policy and oppose this one. And here are three facts. But we have to go back to what is it the policy is trying to achieve? What is the ultimate goal? And is that the best way? Even with poverty relief, the United States federal government has spent $22 trillion trying to eliminate poverty. And when that spending began in 1964, the poverty level dropped initially a little bit, but it had already been dropping for 20 years. And then it leveled out. Is taking taxpayer dollars and using it to alleviate poverty in the way we have done, is that the best way? Not just is that the way to ease our conscience, but is that the best way to help poor people thrive? So policies always have to begin with what are the core principles? What is it we are about? 
Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And then you move into the policies and then you can deal with the personalities. Right, right. So our yeah. founders started with the principles. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Then they went to the policies. We're, we're going to have a, a legislature and an executive branch and a judicial branch because we believe that human beings tend to be selfish. The power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, as Lord Acton said. Yeah. Once you have the principles and the policies in place, you can deal with the personalities. If you start with the personalities, oh, I hate so-and-so, so therefore, whatever, therefore, I'm against. You can never arrive at rational policies, and you will never arrive at any core principles on which good decisions can be made. So we have to go back to the beginning and start with what is it that it, we're ultimately about? What do we agree on? And then what is the outcome that we think was, is a good outcome? And then how would we pursue that? And so it's helpful that you said something earlier, I, I just want to emphasize, and that is how can we order a society if we have no understanding of what's right and wrong? And it's basically just everyone's view of truth. And you, you mentioned puppies. I, I sometimes kind of joke with people like, look, the only moral consensus that we can drum up in this country is that one, it's okay to hate Nazis and to love puppies. Like that's, that's it. That's like all we got, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so how do you, how do you run a society on that? But then something else you mentioned that Starting first with Christians, I'm not sure many Christians kind of have a view for their citizenship or how they engage outside of their church. And I've been talking a good bit about the germ of the idea of the United States is that we are all created equal. And that's a biblical idea that I that we can get around and try to build a society around. So, well, yeah. Dr. Myers, you've been so generous with your time. Just a few more questions, kind of in a blitz round here. Um, you, you've mentioned a number of things. But I was interested if you had maybe just an idea or two about specifically kind of applying this book and the principles in it to kind of public square ministry and Christians that are stepping into public life. I wrote a chapter on politics in the book. Okay. I know it's controversial, but it is true that Jesus followers who believe that Jesus is the truth are the ones who transform politics and gave us the structure of political discourse that we embrace in the United States today. So the very idea that we have three branches of government to hold one another accountable goes back to the idea that humans have a sinful nature. The, the very idea of, of um, the, the balance between the government, the family, and the church, three different spheres of society, uh, the interests of which must be promoted by the others, and the boundaries of which must be respected by all of the others is a biblical understanding. It goes back to a guy named Abraham Kuyper, who was a theologian and for a short period of time, the prime minister of the Netherlands. So those, those are the, that's the sort of thing that I, I focus on in the book. And I, I think that engagement rather than escape is always the posture of, of a Christian. I wouldn't say that Jesus had a political viewpoint per se, but he definitely had a theology of engagement. You move mm -hmm. toward rather than away from. You embrace rather than reject. You mm -hmm. love rather than hate. You engage rather than escape. That's so encouraging because I, I think we can. It's easy to look at culture and just say, you know what? I'm, I don't have time for that. That's dirty. I don't want to get involved. But I, just looking back at the history of the church, um, of all of those that have been engaging in public life, it was always like William Wilberforce. I'm it, slavery is hard to deal with in Britain, but I'm I'm going to attack it. That sort of of idea. Also, and I I appreciate you being willing to share a little bit about your cancer diagnosis. And I'm just thinking of all the ministry leaders and just committed Christians out there that have have had to work and live and lead through so much uncertainty. I can't imagine leading a a national ministry like Summit with you know, international impact as well. And just getting that and then having to, for a period of time, try to lead that ministry, lead your family with not even knowing, you know, how, what's going to happen next. And so would you have any kind of thoughts or, or lessons that you learned about leading through uncertainty? Oh, wow. Uh, yes. The, I realized that, that my desire to control the outcome is less than helpful. What was most helpful is learning to walk alongside of people to arrive at an outcome that is something that brings glory to God. 
So I, uh, that's partly delegation, but it's partly the training. What, what are the core principles that I want everybody on my team to operate by? So if, if I'm not in the office, if I'm in a, in treatment with chemo, which sets you aside, you can't really do a lot else. Would they know what kinds of decisions to make based on the, uh, the outcomes that we're moving toward mm -hmm. rather than me trying to control that outcome? So a lot of coaching, a lot of mentoring, I think is part of that. Um, you know, letting everybody on my team know if I know God's working in different ways through all of our lives, but my goal would be that we work together in such a way that we kind of plan that we're going to work together for the rest of our lives. That's mm -hmm. sort of the mindset that we want to have. I'm committed to you. I want to protect you, take care of you. And then my goal as a leader is to knock down the barriers that would stop you from being successful in achieving mm -hmm. the mission. Taking on that mindset really paid off during that time because I was out. I was out of the office for four straight months wow. with uh, 66 hours of chemo infusions. Mm -hmm. And during that time, some aspects of our ministry, uh, really, they were really thriving. <laughs> Maybe I should be out of the office more often. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, what's going on here? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I appreciate those insights and I know there are a number of, of, especially pastors going through COVID and everything else, trying to lead through that. Uh, I know it's going to be helpful to them. Yeah. So as we close, just kind of a, a final question. And and we, I just did, I wanted to say thank you for your faithfulness. And sometimes in ministry, people kind of run here and there. And I'm always blessed by those that just God puts them in a vineyard. They, they steward that vineyard faithfully for a long period of time, and they see a lot of fruit. So thank you for that. But if you had a, a billboard on which you could put a message to the gospel preaching church in the United States, what would you put on it? I would put the following, and I don't know if this all fits on one billboard. <laughs> we, you truth, can have multiple. It's okay. <laughs> truth. It's right. Yeah. It's like several down the road. Yeah. There you go. The first one would say truth exists. The second billboard would say truth is not just a mathematical formula. The third billboard would say, truth is not just a set of logical propositions. And the final billboard would say, the truth is a person. Mm. It's Jesus. Mm. And truth changes everything. Amen. I was just kind of letting that sink in and, and taking it down. Um, amen. What what a message that we need now, that certainly as we turn back to Christ. So Dr. Myers, thank you so much. And as we get this released, the, the book will be available. I, you've heard about it here. I encourage our listeners to go pick it up and also take advantage of the other resources from Summit Ministries. Dr. Myers, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Josh. My pleasure.